presentation to change. Sorry. There's always a little technical difficulty in the beginning, right? Happy Earth Day. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel, for introducing me. I am the executive director of the HRA. We are the Regional Governmental Recycling and Waste Management Authority serving 12 municipalities in Western Connecticut. Here's the map. Uh, I have been with the HRA for 12 years. We were created in 1986 when the state stopped permitting landfills and closed them. And we are considered a municipal agency under Connecticut state law. We manage the waste supply and disposal agreements for our member municipalities, including Brookfield, and we assist towns with compliance and state regulations. We love to provide public education programs to schools and organizations like this evening. And we also provide one day special events such as household hazardous waste and e-waste collections. And we register and permit all the waste and recycling haulers, also known as collectors. You should all know that every collector must be permitted in order to do business in your town. So let's talk about the waste stream first. The waste stream is, it's complex. It's a complex system of generators, transporters, transfer stations, processors, and disposal facilities. Generators range from you and I, single family households, multifamily units, apartment buildings to complexes and private communities, small businesses, restaurants, corporations, retailers, casinos, hospitals, schools, universities, even nursing homes and hospitals and so on. I could probably have a huge list, but you get the picture that every day generating millions of tons of waste a year in Connecticut. It's not as simple as deciding which bin to use as though there are only two. And most people just think that there's a trash and there's a recycling bin. It's much more complicated and inconvenient than that. We have a waste problem. Most, most folks don't know um, what they can and can't recycle or what should or shouldn't be done with certain items. And it's interesting enough, many people just don't even care. And waste is local as we as towns, uh, we must provide disposal options for our residents and the state must create and or support infrastructure for disposal. The problem we have in Connecticut is we produce more solid waste than we manage within our borders. And in the next year or two, we will be faced and forced to begin railing our waste out of state to landfills. So the success of Connecticut reducing its waste is dependent on residents and even businesses deciding what's important and what's not in changing their behavior. It really starts with you and I. So I thank you for taking the time this evening to learn a little bit about waste reduction and recycling right. So solid waste management is a universal issue that affects every single person in business in the world. Think about that for just one moment. In your town alone, no matter your financial status or your ethnic origin, every single person generates trash. Not every person owns a home or has children or owns animals or drives a car or uses public transportation, but everyone does generate solid waste and it must be managed. Everyone must obtain services for waste disposal or take it to your local transfer station or drop off. Did you know that recycling is mandatory in Connecticut? Everyone must recycle. That includes residents, whether living in a single or multifamily building, every business, including nonprofits and all public and private and agencies and institutions. It's the law. Now think about this, no matter which generator you represent, a resident, a business, a school, even a municipality, we put the trash out and we forget about it. We don't worry where it will go. We just wanna know when will it go. No matter the end markets or final destination for material, it starts with the people willing to do the right thing, it's a cultural change, a shift in behavior and attitude. What motivates people ultimately is their wallets. If it costs too much, they reject the change. 
If it doesn't cost anything, they take advantage. Americans produce more waste per person than any other place on earth. So let's take a look what's in our trash. This data is from this, a study conducted by Connecticut DEP. It shows what we here in Connecticut are throwing away in our household trash. Just take a look at this. In this pie graph, 25% is paper, but what can we do with paper? We can recycle it. And 32% is organic matter, like food scraps, and it can be composted and removed. Almost 13% is plastic, it's recyclable. Almost 11% is C&D, which is construction and demo. Maybe you have a small renovation at home. You replaced a toilet or a window or part of your roof or a whole roof. But much of it is more small projects in the waste stream. All of that could be repurposed, recycled, and reclaimed into other products. And it really shouldn't go in the solid waste stream. So we can take that out. Nearly 5% is metals. 2% is still glass in our waste stream. This is the garbage stream, not the recycling stream. 2% are electronics, which is recyclable for free. You don't um, even need a permit for a local transfer station. It's a state program. I'll get into that shortly. And a little small percentage of household hazardous waste. We're left with 10%, 10%. So 90% of our waste stream could be diverted, reused, repurposed recycled, reclaimed, and we wouldn't have a waste crisis in the state of Connecticut. So now that we have like sort of dissected the waste stream, do you know where our trash goes? It goes to a waste to energy plant. And I wanna give you a chance to see what a waste to energy plant looks like and how it works. I'm gonna share my sound and play you a video. Sorry, it's not playing for you. There we go. Wheel of Raider Technologies owns and operates modern energy from waste facilities. Unlike conventional power plants, these sophisticated facilities safely and effectively convert waste materials into clean, renewable energy, recycling useful byproducts. Here in our plants, we weigh post-recycled waste delivered from residential, commercial, and special waste customers before transporting it to the tipping floor. Material is visually inspected before being pushed into the fuel bunker. This renewable fuel can vary widely in moisture content and thermal value, so it is continually managed and monitored in the bunker to ensure consistency. Overhead cranes then load the material into hoppers, where hydraulic rams feed the waste fuel into integrated furnace boiler units. In these units, we combust the waste fuel at extremely high temperatures, moving it steadily through the boiler on reciprocating grate systems that ensure complete combustion and minimize residues. We continually draw air from the waste storage areas into the boiler, creating a constant negative pressure that prevents the escape of dust and odors. A selective non-catalytic reduction system injects a urea mix into the combustion gas to reduce nitrogen oxide emissions. Hot combustion gases pass by a series of boiler tubes filled with water, creating high-pressure steam. The steam is used to drive turbine generators and produce electricity, which is sold to electrical grids to power local homes and businesses. The steam can also be sold to industrial processes or for district heating and cooling. We condense the remaining steam into purified water and return it to the system to allow further renewable energy production. Prior to safely disposing of the inert ash, we remove and recycle ferrous metals, such as iron and steel, and non-ferrous metals, such as copper and aluminum, from the ash residue that are sold and recycled into new products. At select ash monofills, our enhanced metals recycling technologies extract further quantities of metals from the ash residue that are sold and recycled into new products. After heat from combustion, or flue gas, is absorbed in the boiler to produce steam, the flue gas exits the boiler and powdered activated carbon is injected to capture mercury and trace organic compounds. The flue gas then enters a spray dryer absorber or dry scrubber where lime is combined with the gas to neutralize acid gases, including sulfur dioxide and hydrogen chloride. 
The flue gas then passes through a fabric filter or electrostatic precipitator where particulates, including fly ash, lime, carbon containing mercury and organics, and any remaining pollutants are removed. Cleaned flue gas exits through the stack after a series of continuous emissions monitors analyze and record emissions levels. Because energy from waste facilities provides such an essential and continuous environmental service, we closely monitor our operations from each facility's control room. Our plant engineers are supported by technical experts in our U.S.-based performance center in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. With a proven technology that safely converts diverse waste materials into clean energy and recycles commercial byproducts, Wheelabrator helps sustainably power communities while protecting the environment. Okay, so we are at a crossroads in Connecticut on how we will achieve a more sustainable system to collect, process, and dispose of our waste into the future. If we are going to take a comprehensive approach to solid waste management in Connecticut, we need to look beyond household trash and recycling. Now that you've seen where our waste goes and know that we have a capacity issue, let's drive and dive into some of our solutions. The state of Connecticut, I'm sorry. The state of Connecticut must build a solution around waste reduction. What does that mean? It means we need to look beyond waste disposal as just waste to energy or landfilling and consider alternative methods of managing material that includes reuse, repurpose, repair, remanufactured, recycling. The items we dispose of are resources, not just waste. Waste, re re waste reduction is waste that never gets created and doesn't have waste management costs. Now here are some solutions related to waste reduction. What if we made more manufacturers and producers responsible for the end of life of their products? We make them share the responsibility of disposal and costs through EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility. We currently have four EPR laws for paint, mattresses, electronics, and thermostats. For example, when you buy a gallon of paint, you now pay an eco fee. It's not a tax. It is a fee that goes directly into a stewardship program managed by the industry to collect, transport, and recycle any unused paint. The same for mattresses and electronics. It's the manufacturers who now share the burden of collection and disposal, not just the municipalities, removing the cost burden from all of us as taxpayers and shifting it directly onto the individual consumer and the manufacturer. Through EPR, consumers have reliable disposal options. It removes the guessing and the burden. Maybe another solution is to pull the waste stream apart and build stronger source separation programs, such as organics programs, food scrap drop-off for those who don't want to home compost, textile programs that collect everything, not just items that can be resold, source separation of glass that I will explain a little bit uh, shortly further in the presentation. What about changing the way we pay for trash? Requiring the generator, you, me, and every individual to pay for the volume by units. And it forces the individual or the business to reevaluate the volume of material they dispose. It's called unit-based pricing. So many people are against it, but when you understand it better, you realize it could actually save you money, a lot of money, because waste is measured by weight, not volume. Think of it like a utility. If your electric bill was $200 a month, a set fee, you wouldn't be mindful. You'd never turn off your lights. But think about it. You would have no choice but to pay the same amount every month, $200. Wouldn't you wanna say like, hey, if I turn my lights off or use less, I wanna pay less. You would be frustrated. You had no control of the cost of your electric bill. Well, what about trash? you all pay the same amount every month. And because trash tends to be around $30 a month, many just ignore it, but it could be cheaper. Why shouldn't trash be measured and paid for accordingly? And if it was, folks would change their habits and produce less waste. 
What's also key is people need to recycle right. Recycling right increases the value of the material and reduces costs. So let's look at the recycling stream. You'll discover that it's not just the material that's our problem, it's the people and the choices being made. Single stream recycling, now referred to as mixed recycling, became popular for its convenience in 2013. Residents put everything they think could or should be recycled into their carts. It was designed to make recycling easy in hopes people would recycle more, but it has resulted in people recycling wrong and it has hurt the quality of the material we are trying to recycle. The amount of trash also known as contamination increased so high it created what we call the China sword crisis. China's national sword policy began in early 2018. China banned many scrap materials, what's typically in your recycling bin, and wouldn't accept material unless it met an extremely strict contamin rate, contamination rate of 0.5%. Contamination rates in Connecticut and throughout the US range from 15 to 25%. So that's a pretty big gap from 15 to 20% to an acceptable rate of 0.5%. Before 2018, China had been the designation for about 40% of the United States paper, plastic, and other recyclables. So it created a pretty big crisis of what to do with all the material we were generating here. The good news, we now have domestic markets. And since 2018, we've begun to move the material without the dependence of China. And finally, the value is beginning to increase. But in order for the collection and disposal system to be sustainable, we must take a new look at what we recycle and how we recycle and learn why it is important to recycle right, not recycle more. Remember, the purpose of recycling is to reduce the amount of natural resources we mine from the earth and recirculate the resources by recycling existing products. For example, anything made of aluminum can be recycled repeatedly, infinitely, not only aluminum cans, but aluminum foil, food trays, window frames, automotive components, all can be melted down and used to make the same or other products again and again. Used aluminum drink cans can be recycled and back on supermarket shelves as new drink cans in as little as 60 days. Recycling aluminum takes 95% less energy than producing it from its raw materials. Recycling process also generates only 5% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Aluminum doesn't occur in pure form. Aluminum originates from bauxite and ore typically found in topsoil of various tropical or subtropical regions. Once it's mined, aluminum within the bauxite ore is chemically extracted into alumina, an aluminum oxide compound through the bearer process. In a second step, the alumina is smelted into pure aluminum metal through the Hall Herald process. So we need to stop through aluminum, stop throwing aluminum away in the trash and recycle it as much as we can to preserve the bauxite and reduce emissions by reducing the energy it takes to, to smelt the existing aluminum. So, okay, uh, I think that's enough about um, the recycling of mixed, uh, the mixed recycling stream. I wanna dive into uh, the details. Knowing where recycling goes will help you understand why it's important to put only acceptable items from the what's in and what's out list. We'll go over that list shortly. Remember, it all starts with you. This is a material recovery facility. This is where your recyclables are sorted, bailed, and sold as a commodity into the market to be made into new products. I'm gonna show you uh, how it works. Here's how he works. First, trash from the tipping floor is loaded into a hopper and it's transported up the conveyor belt where it's metered for consistent volume. As incoming material moves along the conveyor belt, workers pull out large items and those materials not capable of being recycled. Unusable garbage is also picked out at this time. These items are placed into a bin and will be transported to a final destination where they recover the energy through incineration. The recyclables continue down the conveyor belt to the first stage, a three-tier sorting system. 
the screener allows the cardboard to float to the top of the discs and 3D material falls below. Since glass is the heaviest, it's crushed between steel plates and drops to the bottom level where it's transferred to the glass cleanup system. The recyclables are then passed through the polisher, which separates out the newspaper. This material is then quality checked and placed into bins for later baling. Oh, sorry about that. The next polisher removes all the remaining fiber or mixed paper with the same quality check stations and bin storage for later processing. Mr. Murph sorters are trained to ensure items are sorted accurately throughout the process. As a result, the amount of contamination in the final recycling bale is greatly reduced, giving us a 95% recovery rate. Now that all the fiber and glass have been removed, the remaining 3D objects such as aluminum, metal, and plastics move on to the second stage of processing. The metal is pulled from the conveyor stream by a cross belt magnet. This pulls metal, tin cans, and all other ferrous material. The next stage uses an anti-magnet called an eddy current. This machine creates a force field that repels the aluminum up and over a divider while forcing the plastics to fall down into the next stage of optical scanning. The first pass of optical scanning separates the PET or plastic 1 from HDPE or plastic 2. The PET plastic is color commingled with lids and labels attached. The final optical scanning pass separates the natural or clear HDPE from the color. This optical scanner can identify which plastics have colors and which don't. By identifying each container's position on the belt, colored plastic is blown into one bin while clear plastic falls off the belt into a separate bin. When all materials are sorted, each one is pushed onto a conveyor belt that brings them to the baler. The baler compresses the material, which can then be shipped off to create new products from the recycled material. Each bale can weigh anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 pounds. Okay. I cut the video off because it does go a little bit longer, but that's pretty much enough information for you to understand how a material recovery facility works. So, this is the material recovery. This is material from a material recovery facility, um, and as you can see, <laughs> it's typically dirty, bagged with unacceptable material. This is what we call contamination. The reality of what we are facing is not just about what to do with the material, but how we get generators, you and I, to change their behavior to do the right thing and improve the system. Look at this picture, it's awful. It doesn't even look like recycling. That's because much of it isn't. We need to learn to recycle right. So why so much contamination? The primary factors are really, there's four elements. Simple non-compliance. Some residents and businesses are just blatantly bad. They have no intention on recycling and just use their recycling bin as a second trash can. Two, there's the believers. Some think virtually everything is recyclable. There's the hopefuls, those who think this should be recyclable and they just put it in the stream. And then there's root specific issues. Contamination is seen in some communities due to transient population and language barriers. Can you guess what this is? <laughs> it's glass that has been sent to a material recovery facility via the mixed recycling stream. This is what the glass looks like after it's been sorted through the MRF. Glass is a complex issue, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be. Glass is infinitely 100% recyclable. It takes less energy to produce a glass bottle from recycled glass than from raw material. So what's the problem? It's the way we collect glass. Glass should be collected separately but it has become universal that we collect it in our mixed recycling stream. Why? Because it's convenient, not because of anything else. When you take an even closer look, you can see the problem. Prescription bottles, bottle caps, shredded paper, 
batteries, and other bits. They don't belong in the recycling stream. Education alone will not stop people from putting it in. What happens to glass at a center material recovery facility? This glass, it typically ends up 500 miles out of the state of Connecticut in a landfill. But I do have some good news. We now have a separate glass collection throughout the HRRA region. This is an example of one, our, one of our glass collection containers. This container is located between the Brookfield Fire Department and the Town Hall on Pocono Road. And this is what glass looks like now. Big difference between the photo that you just looked at, right? Now, this is a note on shredded paper. It does not belong at all in the mixed stream. It should be recycled separately. But because of the simple fact that it is paper, folks put it in the blue bin. Why? Because they want it to be recycled. They wish for it to be recycled, even when we tell them no. Residents and businesses should only shred the part of a document that is confidential and recycle the rest as whole paper. So these are propane tanks and cement blocks that were actually placed in someone's recycling container at the curb. They do not ever belong in recycling. Propane tanks come in all sizes from one pound to 20 pound, and they are not always empty. They are essentially a small bomb for a hauler, a transfer station, or a material recovery facility. They just don't belong. And just because they're metal or just because anything is metal doesn't mean that it goes in your recycling bin. Most metal goes in scrap metal at the transfer station, not your recycling bin. We call these tangles, cords and wires that folks wanna believe can be recycled. They get wrapped around the equipment and cause major shutdowns at our material recovery facilities. And it adds cost to the processing. They don't belong. Electronic wires like this actually can go in our e-waste container at a transfer station. E-waste is an EPR program, an extended producer responsibility program. So any resident can recycle electronics for free at a local drop-off. Oh, do I need to say anything about this? Dead plants in the recycling stream? I wanna believe that the person who put this in their recycling bin wanted to recycle the plastic pot, but the dirt in the plant doesn't belong. This is the reality that transfer stations and material recovery facilities face when it comes to material management. The bottom line, there are controllable elements and uncontrollable elements when it comes to material management. The very first step is the material entering the stream at the curb or at the business. This is the reality and we need to get individuals to make better choices. So if you ever wondered, why can't I put a plastic bag or plastic film in my mixed recycling stream? This is why. Every three to four hours, the material recovery facility has to shut down so that men, these poor two guys, manually cut out the bags and plastic film from the V-screen separator. They get caught up and they have to shut the entire system down. So you need to recycle your plastic bag and film from bread bags to dry cleaner bags, to Ziploc bags to grocery bags at your retail locations. During COVID, many locations took a pause on collection, um, but larger locations like Kohl's, Target, Home Depot, some of those other larger box stores are still collecting plastic film. Please return your plastic film to a retail location and do not put it in your mixed recycling bin because ultimately it will just end up in the trash like this. Oops. So the goal is to produce clean, valuable material to be manufactured into new products. And the only way we can get there is if we recycle right. So let's go through the state of Connecticut's universal recycling guide, what's in, what's out. We're gonna review it into sections. It's divided into four sections, paper, glass, metal, and plastic. We're gonna start with paper. 
So if you're looking uh, at the top of the guide in the green section, that's in. The blue section is out. So what is in for paper is cardboard and box board. Box board is like a cereal box, a cracker box. The carton around um, maybe a soda uh, case. Food and beverage cartons are like milk cartons, orange juice cartons, milk, um, chicken stock, beef stock. Those are cartons, they're in. Junk mail, magazines, newspaper inserts, newsprint, office paper, all the traditional paper are all recyclable. Pizza boxes are in. In Connecticut, we recycle pizza boxes. We don't want your crust, we don't want the knife, we don't want the paper liner, we just want the box. And it's okay if there's a little grease at the bottom. If you're really concerned and you purchase your pizza from a really greasy place, then you certainly can always tear off the top and recycle the top and throw away the bottom. But typically a little bit of grease is actually okay. Technology has changed over time and it's always evolving. So come back and always take a look at the what's in, what's out guide. In the blue section under what's out, gift wrap and gift bags are out. Not all gift wrap is the same. Much of it contains sparkles and glitter and sequins and foil and artificial textures. And there's sometimes sticky gift labels and, or even plastic film, a laminate. So we don't want gift wrap. We don't want gift bags because of the handles. Ice cream containers, they feel and they look a little bit like a milk carton, but they're not. They have a different fiber and polymer makeup. And there's nobody, remember, at the back end when we bailed it, who wants to buy it and make it into a new product? Ultimately, that's what makes something recyclable. Is there enough of it? Can we bail it? And is there someone, a broker, a market, a manufacturer, who wants to buy it to make it into something new? Ice cream containers are out. So are paper cups, hot and cold. Shredded paper, I showed you why. It never makes it through the system. It's too small. Takeout containers, food containers, like a Chinese container, the paper with a metal handle out and tissue paper out. All of this is on our HRA website. So you can get this entire flyer, what's in, what's out, um, right from the HRA website. So if you um, don't want to take notes or can't take notes, don't worry about that. Um, you can get it later. So let's talk about glass. So in the Connecticut Universal Guide, beverage bottles and food bottles are in. Well, certainly we want to recycle them, but we don't want to recycle them in our mixed recycling stream in the HRR region um, because we have the glass collection program. And you saw why. Glass that goes through the mixed recycling stream ultimately either and end, ends up 500 miles out of the state of Connecticut, or if it's going to a new facility that's located here in Connecticut that actually can clean MRF glass, and then they make a industrial uh, cement filler, which is great. But think about the carbon footprint that it takes to collect it at the curb, take it to a transfer station, load it onto a truck, drive it to the MRF, unload it, then it's through the processor, then it's tipped on a floor, put on another truck, and it's sent to the processor to then be cleaned and then made into the new product. Well, then think about our program. You, as a consumer, take it to a drop-off location. That container, a whole, is driven directly to the processor to then be made into the product. Lower emissions, lower carbon footprint, it's much more sustainable economically as well. So please consider taking your glass beverage and food jars to a local drop-off in the HR region and not putting it in your mixed stream. Now, ceramic mugs and plates break like glass, but they're not glass, they're ceramic. And drinking glasses melt at a different temperature than beverage and food bottles and jars. So they don't belong in your mixed stream. If they're still good, you might be able to donate them. Otherwise, they go in your trash. Okay, metals. Aerosol containers, food grade are in. 
That's like whipped cream or olive oil spray. It's food grade. It's an aerosol container, pressurized container that held some type of food content. We can take that as long as it's empty. Aluminum foil, cans and bottles, foil containers, metal lids from cans and bottles, all in. We want that metal. What's out are aerosol containers, such as deodorizers and cleaners and pesticides. Why? It's not that the metal container itself, the aerosol container itself is not recyclable, just as the food grade one. It's that it's a pressurized container with chemicals in it. And because of that, it poses a safety danger to our material recovery facility workers. So if you do have empty aerosol containers, you could consider putting it in your scrap metal at your local drop-off, but please don't put it in your mixed recycling. It's not acceptable. Food tops from yogurt containers are out. They don't belong. And many people ask, well, what if I had collected 20 or 30 of them and crumpled them up into a nice tight ball? Could I recycle them then? The answer is no. Because ultimately, remember, it's going to get picked up at the curb, put into a truck with a, another ton of material, shuffled around, put on a tipping floor, picked up with a front end loader, sent through a processor, that foiled ball isn't going to stay together. And ultimately, it will become part of MRF glass. That pile of material has bits and pieces of items that are two inches minus, and it will just become landfill cover. So please just save time and energy and money by putting the foil tops from yogurt containers directly into your trash. Paint cans do not go in your mixed recycling can, uh, bin. Paint cans, if they have paint in them, can actually be taken to a local drop-off, a retailer, um, under the Paint Care Program, another extended producer responsibility law, or our house, household hazardous waste. We want that paint in liquid form. You don't have to dry out your paint anymore. Once upon a time, you had to do that. If the paint is completely gone because you've used it up and you wanna recycle that paint can, take it to your transfer station for scrap metal, but never put paint cans in your household trash or the mixed recycling stream. Pots and pans have value as metal, bring it to your scrap yard, but they don't belong in the mixed recycling stream. Same for other all small pieces of scrap metal. Take it to a local scrap yard or your transfer station. Spiral wound containers are containers such as um, Pillsbury dough. You hit it on the corner of your counter and it spirals open. That's a spiral wound container or a peanut container. It's cardboard in the middle, metal on the bottom and plastic on the top. Um, another item that's a spiral wound container is like a Pringles container. We don't want them. They are a composite item with metal and cardboard, ultimately would be hit by the magnet and be sent through the metal stream and not the cardboard stream, creating a contamination either way direction. So it doesn't belong. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about plastic. So plastic bottles with or without the cap attached um, are in. So basically, if it's a plastic bottle, whether you put the cap on it or not, we can recycle the plastic bottle. The plastic containers, tubs and lids, like a um, butter container, whip, uh, Cool Whip container, anything that's a tub or a lid. You notice that in this list, we're not talking about numbers, one through seven. One through seven is the resin. It's, a, it's the polymer. It's really made for industry. It's not made for the consumer. So we removed that uh, description in the universal guide and we really more go for uh, descriptions of bottles, containers, tubs, lids. That's what's in. Plastic one-use cups are like solo cups or a Dunkin' Donuts cup, plastic cup. Um, but we don't want the lid or the straw. The lid and the straw will typically fall through the screens, two inches minus, and it will become part of the MRF glass stream. So we don't want that in, uh, just the, the lids and the straws. So what's out? Loose bottle caps. Loose bottle caps never make it through the stream. So if you want to make sure that bottle cap gets recycled, give it a ride. Put it back on the bottle, nice and tight, 
and so that it always has a, a ride through the system and it will get recycled. Otherwise, it's trash. Plastic bags and wrap, I explained to that to you earlier in the presentation, how the uh, gentlemen have to get inside the uh, V-screen separator and manually cut out the plastic wrap from the V-screen. So please uh, do not put plastic wrap in your mixed recycling. It has an asterisk there because in the HRR region, you either return it to retail, but we also have some drop-off programs at some of our local transfer stations. Plastic plates, bowls, and utensils, out. They don't belong. There's not a market for them. Um, not acceptable. Prescription bottles, um, as you saw in the photograph of the Murph flask, they just never make it through the stream. They're too small, they're two inches minus. Um, there are some programs for hard to recycle items, such as prescription bottles. There's some mail-in programs, or there's a company called TerraCycle that will take back um, items such as prescription bottles. They even take uh, toothpaste tubes. So you can look into that as well. Single use coffee containers, also known as K-cups, they have three strikes against them. One, they're actually a polystyrene. They're considered a styrofoam. And if you look, the next item under there is styrofoam is out. The other strike it has is that it is two inches minus. It's too small to make it through the system. The third strike is it has organic matter, coffee grounds in it. Single use coffee containers are out. Do not put them in your mixed recycling stream. Styrofoam cups and containers out. Remember, again, I'm gonna go back to, someone has to be willing to buy it and make it into something new. In the state of Connecticut, we do not have any buyers for styrofoam. There are other places across the country that do collect styrofoam, but we do not. It's out. And water filters um, tend to have a plastic casing on the outside and a lot of folks want to put it in their recycling stream. It is out. They do not belong in the recycling stream. There's no one again on the back end, a broker buying uh, bales of water filters. So those are the four category categories of the what's in, what's out. And, uh, you know, recycling can be simple. It can work, but only if we put the right items in. So we got to recycle right. We want our items to be empty, rinsed, clean, and open. When I say empty, rinsed, and clean, I don't mean you need to be able to eat off of it or out of it again. Just clean enough that you cannot tell what was once in the container. Items should be loose, not bagged, because you saw how the material recovery facility works. There's a lot of moving parts. There are optical scanners, there are V-screen separators, there are magnets and eddy currents. If the items are boxed or bagged or bundled, the material can't be sorted into the categories that it needs to be made into to then be bailed and tied up and sold to market. So please keep them loose. And remember, you're not actually recycling until you've closed the loop. So think about the recycling symbol. It's three chasing arrows. You're buying something, you're using it. Hi, Jennifer, you seem to, oh, you seem to have frozen there for a minute. So you might wanna say again what you said 30 seconds ago. <laughs> okay, sorry, did you hear what sorry I was about saying that. about, I've never had that happen, I don't think. So thank you for letting me know. Um, did you hear what I said about empty, rinse, clean and open? Yes. Okay, and that you don't wanna, um, bag or bundle because you saw how the material recovery facility worked and there are a lot of moving parts, optical sorters, V-screen separators, magnets, eddy currents. And if items are boxed or bagged or bundled, the machines can't do its job to sort them into the categories for them to be bailed. So please keep them loose. And in order to um, really be recycling, you need to purchase recycled content. Look at the chasing arrow of the recycling symbol. It's three arrows being chased. You're buying something, you're using it, and then you're putting it in your bin. Then you're going back to buying something, you're using it, you're putting it in your bin. If you stop the buying part that's recycled, then you're not closing the loop. You're missing an arrow. So the next time you go grocery shopping or shopping for an item, consider its recycled content and consider the natural resources that we are depleting from our environment. 
and consider the amount of energy that it takes to use natural resources versus recycled content. So that's all I have this evening for my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. And I'm also happy to receive email from folks or phone calls in the future um, if your questions are not answered this evening. Rachel, I will take it over to you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, so good. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. That was a lot of information and a lot of new information, at least for me. So thank you very much. Um, so we did have a few questions in the chat already. Um, and if anybody else has any questions, um, please go ahead and type them into the chat and I will ask them. Um, I will ask Jennifer if she can answer them for us. Um, so there are a number of questions um, now and a lot of them have to do with specific items. Um, so I'll just go ahead and I, I'm sure other people have similar questions. So, um, so one person wants to know, um, are the wax coated half gallon milk and juice cartons recyclable? So all, yes, juice cartons are recyclable, tear cartons are recyclable, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, for in, in regards to the takeout containers not being recyclable, um, can you recycle them if you take the metal handle off? They're, no, they're not recyclable. Okay, so it's not that it's the mixed paper and metal, it's... Something. It's also the it's also the paper fibers. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then um, for aluminum foil, how clean um, does it have to be to be recyclable? <laughs> you shouldn't be able to tell what was on the aluminum foil. Um, typically, you can just rinse it off or scrape it off. If you've probably cooked a lasagna in an aluminum pan and you can't get it out, that would go in the trash, unfortunately. Remember, when you also looked at the, um, uh, the waste to energy plant video, if you noticed, the furnace gets very hot to incinerate the solid waste, but ferrous and non-ferrous metals are captured with a, um, a great system, and they actually do reclaim the metals out of the solid waste stream. So that's the nice thing if you do put certain metals and aluminum in your garbage, when it is sent to a waste to energy plant, they are captured. Okay. Sure. Um, what about um, yogurt? Can, oh, sorry, I'm gonna, someone's, I'm gonna mute somebody. Okay. Um, uh, what about yogurt containers, tofu containers? Yes, yogurt tubs and containers are in. Yogurt containers are in. Okay, and like the tofu ones that are, they're a little bit different. Yes, are in. They're in, okay, great. Um, let me scroll down here. Um, Someone wrote, TerraCycle has minimum amounts. They will send you a collection box like at Subaru. Can you be a place for containers? Um, I am an individual that takes forever to accumulate enough, but a school or library or town, oh, I guess probably uh, meaning the library. <laughs> sorry, um, <laughs> sorry. It takes forever to accumulate enough, but a school or library or town hall or HRRA could be a central location. Yes, so we are just an office. We are not a transfer station or a collection um, location for material. Um, but yes, there are some programs, schools have programs and, and other nonprofits might have collection programs. Um, and that is certainly something that individual community members could look into, investigate and create those programs. Okay, sounds good. Um, uh, plastic bags, plastic bread bags, um, you, uh, someone said that you had no mentioned um, that you can return the plastic bread bags to the store. Yes. Yeah, so um, if you go to the HRA website, and actually I'm going to share my, I will share my screen again. Sure. Of um, I'm going to pull up the website. Just bear with me. So do you see our homepage of our website? Yes. Okay, so on the HR website, we have some current events and we have some things that are um, commonly asked questions like plastic bag and film. So you can watch a video about why we don't put recycled um, bags in our recycling stream, but you can also click here to learn more about the return to retail program and what is and, accept is, and is not acceptable. Sorry, we have a little. Um, so it goes through the various types of material um, product overwrap, newspaper bags, bread bags, 
dry cleaner bags. If you're using a, going to recycle a bread bag or even a Ziploc bag, make sure that it's dry and the food contents have been emptied. Sorry, I'm having a sun coming through my window problem <laughs> and I'm trying to find a way to get around it. <laughs> uh, so next question. Um, sure. Um, so um, someone actually asked um, why shredded paper can't be recycled, but I think you did answer that and it's the size. So yeah, just so you know, like office paper is, it's, um, it's very valuable and we want office paper to be recycled and that's shredded paper is often essentially that it's office paper. Um, but the problem is, is the size. It won't be captured to be bailed into a paper bale. Um, so if you want it to be recycled, there are some uh, shredded paper drop-off locations in the region. Um, Brookfield does not have one, but Danbury, uh, the mom and pop, which is now servicing the town of Brookfield, does have a shredded paper container at the mom and pop location where you can take it to be recycled. Then with corporate, you know, with, with companies that have sort of larger scale shredding, you know, just bins where they shred yes. a lot of things, is that recycled? I mean, do they have so that's general. different because it's in large volume mm -hmm. and it's being captured and bailed as shredded paper. It's not being mixed into a stream. It is source separated on its own and being then uh, sent to a processor. Okay, good to know, good to know. Um, let's see here. Um, so someone asked a question about um, a specific um, vendor that they use for their recycling. Okay. Um, and so I won't name the per company. I mean, I don't know if it's relevant or not, but um, basically the person wants to know if there's a way to find out if they follow the same guidelines. So can you, tr basically, can you trust the, 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 the uh, garbage, um, people that you hire. <laughs> that <they're doing> <laughs> well, we hope that we can trust our um, waste haulers and, and most of the time they want to do the right thing. We have some great waste haulers in our region. If a resident ever has a question or concern regarding their waste hauler, if you know they think that they're mixing the recycling with their solid waste, which is often a question in our region or concern from a resident, it usually turns out that if they have a split body truck, it looks like they're co-mingling and in fact that they're not. But any kind of concern, you can always call, call the HRRA and we will look into it. Um, our waste haulers are held to a high standard. And again, many of them do comply. Um, they do want to do the right thing. And uh, it costs them uh, less to recycle and more to um, collect garbage because of the difference in waste fees. Okay. So I'm as we're talking and you're asking questions, I'm just going to close my video for one moment to close that shade. Oh, of course. To answer questions. Go ahead. Ask me the next question. Okay, sure. Um, someone asked, why are recycling bins so small <laughs> that, they, that they always fill multiple ones? And um, and I'm sure other people feel similarly. So um, I'm wondering if that person is from the town of Newtown. Yeah, yeah, she is. Um, yeah. So um, because in the town of Newtown, the town provides an 18 gallon square tub, not a toter. So, um, and that is a choice by the town. The town happens to provide recycling through their taxes. Generally, throughout the region and throughout the state, waste haulers provide what we call toters. They come in 64 gallon or 96 gallon. They're quite large. You can ask your uh, hauler for a larger recycling container and a smaller garbage container. That's a form of unit based price pricing um, for smart saving money and reducing trash. And typically, if you ask your waste hauler, believe it or not, that you want to recycle more and throw away less and you can dicker with them to pay less and say, I only want my trash picked up twice a, twice a month, not every week. Um, if they say no, haul another hauler. So my, um, my screen is still up that I'm sharing. If you go to residence and how to choose a hauler, you will see that on our website, we have all the registered haulers listed on our page. There's almost 60 registered haulers in the region. You can sort by the town that you're in, 
Brookfield's under BK. If you click on Brookfield, you'll get a list of all the sorted Brookfield haulers who are all registered in the town of Brookfield. And these are our haulers who you can talk to regarding, I'd like to have my trash picked up every other week, not once a week. I would like a larger recycling container and a smaller waste container. Um, per, they're ultimately providing a service to you to collect the material at the curb. There's pretty much a base rate to do that, but there's also a cost to them to dispose of the material by weight. So um, consider that the less you throw away, the less it costs them. So that you should be able to get better rates based on what your habits are. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there are a couple more questions about specific items. So why don't we just go through those and then we can get to some of the larger picture. Um, so um, bubble wrap, bubble wrap mailing yep. bags um, pa with paper, with a paper mailing label, are they recyclable? So a manila, uh, the manila envelope that has bubble wrap in it is trash, but bubble wrap itself, it's just the bubble wrap, is recyclable through the wrap program, through that return to retail program. Again, information about that is on our website. Um, another thing that you can do with bubble wrap or styrofoam packaging, you can actually take it to a local mom and pop um, mailing company. You know, there's several like mom and pop FedEx drop off or UPS drop off locations. Often around the holidays, they are packaging and boxing up packages for customers and they need that packaging. So it gets repurposed and reused. So consider donating it. Oh, okay, great. Um, so there are a couple of questions about glass. Um, so uh, about drop off, glass drop offs. Um, someone else had um, talked about, uh, sorry. Um, well, basically, can you just expand a little bit about, about glass? Sure, I, <clears throat> happy to. So um, the glass program was designed to uh, capture the glass and the value of glass, because as I showed you, when it's collected in the mixed stream, it's not getting collected cleanly, a clean stream, so it's not being recycled into another bottle or another product. It was being sent to landfill. So I designed this separate collection of glass throughout the region so that we can ensure that the glass that we have in our homes that we want to recycle are actually getting recycled because until now it wasn't and so it was either going to a location in northern connecticut in south windsor called strategic material that they were making bottle to bottle or now it's being sent to urban mining in beacon falls where it's made into a industrial filler for cement it reduces it has a much uh, smaller carbon emissions and uh, carbon footprint than making cement uh, traditionally. So um, really the purpose was just to capture the glass to make sure it's being recycled uh, the, rather than the way that it, what we were doing with it previously. I, I hope I answered that question. Um, yeah, yeah. And we just want glass food and beverage containers. Okay, someone yeah. actually asked about the lids. Um, the lids are not recyclable, they're trash. So in, in the glass collection program, you can take any metal lids off. Remember, everything gets captured with a magnet through the material recovery facility that's metal. So those, those smaller metal caps will actually get captured. It's the small plastic caps because of the optics can't see it, won't get captured. So remove the metal lids and caps from glass and put it in your mix stream. Um, corks garbage unless you have a drop-off location or, or mailback program. I know the town of Kent actually has one of those community collection programs for corks. Um, but you know, unless your town has something like that, you throw it away. Okay. So someone wrote, um, I've heard that too much recycling material gets picked up that's not worth it or it's not cost effective to recycle. Is that true? Not quite sure what they're exactly referring to, but they're probably mixing a few stories together about, um, so mixed recycling, um, I sort of alluded to this in my presentation, you know, it was created for convenience, it was really popular because we could collect more. Um, but unfortunately, what has happened with single stream is it's highly contaminated. 
single stream could really work and it could work really well if we were all recycling right. And we were recycling only the things that we just went through, only the items in the paper, plastic, glass, and metal category that are in. But all when folks are wishful recyclers or hopeful recyclers, and they're putting in items that don't belong, end up being contamination because it costs us money to get rid of it, that's where recycling goes wrong. Those are the items that aren't getting recycled and gives recycling a bad rap. But all of the things that can be recycled, PET bottles, like water bottles, or um, high density polyethylene, which is like laundry detergent bottles, and the various types of plastic are being bailed. They are being sold. There are brokers and manufacturers buying this material to pelletize it to be made into new products. We are recycling this material. But yes, in fact, there is 15 to 20% of the recycling stream that is not getting recycled, but it's not not getting recycled because they're recycled material that's not. It's 15 to 20% of material that's garbage, like that cushion I showed you in the beginning or bags of, literally bags of garbage that you can't recycle. It's the spiral, spiral wound containers. It's the water filter. It's the things that we're saying, please don't put in your recycling container. Those are not getting recycled because they can't be recycled. So I think, I mean, there were stories that um, a couple of years ago that the, the market in China for buying the single stream um, material, you know, or waste um, that it dried up and that there were, um, there weren't, there, that there was not the market for that. Is that not true of the single stream in Connecticut or is it, is it more limited than the stories that you would hear might seem to indicate? So at the time when China Sword came about in about 2018, um, what it created a bottleneck because a majority of the material, 40% of our material in the United States was going to China. And all of a sudden China said, nope, we don't want it. It's too highly contaminated. We're, we're gonna put restrictions on what you can send us. And you can't blame them. They don't want our trash. They wanted our recyclables. They didn't want the trash but we had brokers who were sticking trash in or not caring about the trash to save money or to make money, right? And so China created the strict rule, like we only want 0.5, we want your recyclables and are only willing to take it if it has less than 0.5% contamination. What that did was it created um, that bottleneck and our brokers and manufacturers were scrambling to well, what they were gonna do with it. They found other avenues, they found other routes, they found other buyers. It took a while, it changed the cost. We went from many municipalities receiving a revenue stream across the state of Connecticut and across the country to paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to get rid of the recyclables. That's changed over time. Manufacturers have created um, some domestic markets and uh, we now have brokers here in the United States who are, are buying this material, selling it to recyclers who are processing the material and then selling it to manufacturers right here in the United States. It's changing. We're also seeing the value changing. So our recycling tip fees are going down because um, there is value in this material. So it's a shift. It's, it's just like any market. They go up, they go down. They go up, they go down. Um, so right now things are getting better. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, someone had a comment um, that first to thank you for the presentation, um, but then to say, I've been a recycler for my whole life. And I wanted to say that Connecticut does not make recycling, reusing and repurpose, repurposing, et cetera, easy. So, <laughs> so. Yes, no, you know what? I, and I appreciate that comment and it's a concern and a frustration for not only you, whomever um, made that comment for many people across the state and across the United States, actually probably across the world. Unfortunately, you know, I don't have a lot of control and neither does the state of Connecticut have a lot of control over what manufacturers create um, for packaging. So think about that. We, we don't have a control over what Procter & Gamble or Unilever or any of these large companies, Coca-Cola, um, make their products uh, package, you know, put their products in what types of packaging. Look at applesauce. It used to be in a 
glass jar. Then it was a plastic container. Now it's these uh, terra packs that are, you know, uh, airtight and you suck them out of a, uh, a multi-pack layered uh, packaging that you can't recycle. That's not our fault. That's the manufacturer's fault. What yeah. we need to do as consumers is challenge are the the products that we buy challenge the companies of the products that we buy and tell them i don't like the packaging i can't recycle it um you're they're not being a part of the sustainable solution or the circular economy it's more of a linear system linear meaning they they make it we use it we throw it away it's linear right. well the circular economy they make it we use it we give it back it gets recycled and they put it back in their product and it's circular. Um, yes, recycling is frustrating because it's always evolving with technology and innovation with manufacturing. And it's up to us as well to challenge that. And it's also up to us to make sure that we challenge the sustainable um, practices of these manufacturers. So I'm sorry that it's frustrating. It's frustrating for me because even for myself doing this for 12 years, um, I'm always learning and having to change and evolve with technology. And, you know, one day pizza boxes weren't recyclable. Now they are. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, <laughs> once upon a time, we recycled glass separately anyway, and all glass was being recycled. Then we had single stream and then it wasn't. And then we had to go back to source separation. It's frustrating. I'm frustrated too, but that's why I appreciate, look, you're here tonight. You're learning about it. You're also wanting to continue down this path. So I appreciate that. Someone, um, some of uh, two comments. Uh, what, one is, you know, it's, thank you. And also um, he writes, it seems like we know what to do and we have known, but the effort to recycle goes up against the human behaviors associated with not being inconvenienced. Um, a gross factor and other reasons as well. Um, I don't believe additional education and pleading is going to have a significant, a significant impact. I think it has to hit people in the wallet. What do you say? I agree. <laughs> I, well said, whoever said that, very well said. Um, that's why I believe in unit-based pricing um, where you pay for what you throw away. Um, recycling, you know, if recycling could be cheaper, it, recycling isn't free, by the way. You saw that there's this large facility it has to go to to be sorted and bailed, and there's workers and labor and mechanics and robots. And so it's not free, you know, um, to, to do. But if we could get it to the place where recycling did cost less and garbage was more, I do believe if it hit their wallets, our residents would change their behavior and we would see better quality material and we'd see more material that's right and less waste. We would see more repurposing and uh, repair shops, for example. Um, actually, I'm sharing your screen with you. you better. That would be nice. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's that. fine. There, that's nice, sir. Um, uh, okay, so and someone wanted to know, you know, how how do we educate more people about what's in and what's out? Um, and you know, there were some things that were um, changes from what some of us might have remembered from before or whatever. So, um, any thoughts on educating more people? I guess that's what you're doing right now. Yes, yes. So, um, I I have been doing this every Thursday, the month of April. So, if you've enjoyed this evening, certainly share with your friends and your colleagues, and um, they can join me next Thursday. The link is on our HRA website. Um, you can share the Recycle CT Foundation link. That's um, the What's In, What's Out guide. Um, and soon there'll be a, an app we can have on our phones in the state of Connecticut, and you can just simply type something in and write in your kitchen, and you don't have to go searching or Googling it or trying to figure it out. It will be uh, Connecticut specific, and you can say, hey, can I recycle this pizza box? And it will come up and say yes. So um, utilizing technology too um, will also help us. Um, um, I just so have a question. About um, recycling small batteries, um, where, where can can they recycle small batteries or any okay, oh, so, about battery recycling in general? Yep. So rechargeable and single use batteries are acceptable in our e-waste take back programs at our transfer station. So you, there is a special box container at the front of the e-waste e trailer at our transfer stations. Just place your batteries in there and we'll take them back. You can also bring them to a household hazardous waste event. Okay. Uh, and light bulbs, um, talk about light bulbs. 
Light bulbs, if um, compact fluorescent light bulbs can be recycled through our e-waste program. Incandescent, the old fashioned light bulbs are just household trash. Okay. Um, someone said, I bring my recycling in clear recycling bags, um, but she wants to know if you're saying that, that she should cut and empty the bag into the bin, um, say at the mom and pop, um, that, she had, that this person had asked and was told that it didn't matter, but do you, do you think it does matter? Okay, so um, they probably asked the transfer station if you're bringing it in a clear bag, it is acceptable in a clear bag. I have to take into account that not all um, collectors are able to provide toters or tubs to their customers. And a, there's a lot of residents who put their recyclables at the curb in a bag. The bag though must be clear. It can't be white, it can't be black, it can't be a garbage bag because they will assume it's garbage. They are not going to risk the labor and the workers on the line to open up that bag to see what the contents are. So the fact that you're bringing your recyclables in a clear bag is the first step. It will get cut open if it's clear. The bag will get, if there's actually uh, vacuums above the workers on the conveyor belt and they lift that bag up and it gets sucked up into a tube, um, they just prefer it because if they don't catch that bag at the front line on that conveyor belt, as you see, it can't, it can't be sorted. Um, but technology does allow us to take it in a clear bag. Um, someone commented or asked, um, has HRRA proposed something like a waste fee on goods sold in Connecticut that could then, that could then be used to both incentivize retailers on the environmental impact of products and also pay for the true costs associated with the waste? Yes, thank you. Um, so the state of Connecticut itself and part of the what we call the CCSMM is the Connecticut uh, um, Coalition for Sustainable Material Management, a lot of acronyms in our world, um, has proposed what we're calling EPR for packaging. So it would be an eco fee on each individual product. So similar to si similar concept to the person who just made a comment that yes, whether or not that will curb folks behavior, I'm not sure. Um, think about it like the bottle bill. Uh, right now, it's only five cents per container. It is being proposed to change that to 10 cents. Right now, it's a law that actually got passed. It's a bill that got passed out of the Environment Committee. Hopefully, it will get called on the floor and be passed this year. Um, that they will increase the five cents to 10 cents, and they are going to expand um, the types of acceptable material from uh, Gatorades and iced tea, et cetera. The idea behind that is the 10 cents incentivizes the consumer to take it back. That five cents doesn't have the same value it had in the, in the early 1980s. So it incentivizes the consumer to take it back to be ensure that it gets recycled. Um, deposit systems and deposit laws work. Um, and it's been proven to work when they've increased the, the fee to the, the current economy. Um, so that's another similar way of incentivizing consumers to do the right thing. I also have another question that came to me directly. I'm asking, where does Brookfield's recycling go? Is the facility in Brookfield? So um, Brookfield doesn't have a recycling center, although the first selectman of Brookfield is looking into um, providing a recycling center for the residents. And we've been we're researching that on his behalf. Uh, the recycling that is picked up at the curb throughout the town of Brookfield is taken to Danbury, to the Oak Ridge transfer station on White Street. From there, it is aggregated with the rest of the region and transported to Shelton. And that's where our material recovery facility is for this region. That's where our material goes. Um, the second question from this person is, they were wondering if I was familiar with the Scarlsdale Zero Waste Program and if it's something Brookfield might explore, um, and then um, shared the link. Scarlsdale's food scrap recycling program came from HRA. So it's, um, I started the first food scraps collection program in the town of Bridgewater. We now have five food scrap collection programs throughout the region, uh, Bridgewater, Newtown, Reading, Bridgefield, and New Fairfield all have compost food scrap collection programs. If and when Brookfield has a recycling center, we would definitely consider that. We are working on a program for Kent um, for them to have a drop off. 
The town of Sherman does not have a recycling center, but I'm also working with Sherman to utilize the new Fairfield drop-off center. And just so you know, even if you are not a new Fairfield resident, even if you're a Brookfield resident, you can buy an annual pass to New Fairfield and you can take your food scraps there and drop them off. Um, they cost about $2 for a seven gallon bucket. Um, and if you wanna learn more about that, you can certainly reach out to me. Um, so, but yes, I'm very familiar with the Scarlesdale program. They came to us and um, we sort of mentored them through their process to get them started up and running. So. Um, I hope I answered that question. So um, do you have any more questions on your end? Yeah, there are actually a lot more questions. I think we'll probably have to wrap up at 7.30 and okay, I get to all of them, but, which is too bad. But um, so, um, so a couple of people asked about Newtown and glass recycling and they're wondering because they're thinking it's, they're following something different there. So um, uh, one said, um, you know, Newtown allows glass and mixed recycling um, at the curb but it has to be separated and taken to the transfer station. So if you're saying you'd prefer that they separate their glass at home, um, is that is that it and not included as a single stream, but that, um, but that Newtown, I guess, is still accepting it in. Yeah, so what we're doing throughout the entire region right now, including Newtown, Brookfield, everywhere, is we had a slow, what I'm calling a sort of a soft launch with the glass program. First, we started at the transfer stations, getting the containers in place, getting the folks who use the transfer station used to separating their glass. The next step, which we were hoping to launch um, actually a while ago, but it's taken, there's a little bit of a delay just because of the volume of material and making sure that the uh, end disposal location like urban mining or strategic can handle the amount of material we're sending to them. We've sort of pulled back a little bit on this launch. We will soon be asking everyone, including at the who, those who use curbside, to stop putting glass in your mixed stream and please utilize the transfer station. Do you have to? Is it a mandate? No. Um, you're not gonna get in trouble if you don't do it. We're just asking you, now that you see what's actually happening to the glass, we're asking you to do the right thing. It doesn't mean you can't use your curbside for everything, but maybe once a month you go down to the transfer station and you drop off your glass to help us do the right thing, to help us clean up the mixed recycling stream. We can't make everyone, but we hope that it will incentivize you just knowing and understanding what actually happens to it in the mixed stream. Uh, someone actually asked um, where the transfer station is. So can you say, tell us where the um, transfer station that, the, uh, that a resident of Brookfield would use? Yeah, so the um, town of Brookfield residents use the Oak Ridge Transfer Station located at 307 White Street in Danbury. So you go down Federal Road, past Du Leonard's, past all of the uh, dealerships, and then you come to White Street, the intersection of White Street. Take a left on White Street and you'll see the transfer station right there on your left, Oak Ridge. And inside that major transfer station is what we call the mom and pop. And the mom and pop is for residents to drop off their material. And if you go back to the hrra.org website and under drop off centers, click on Brookfield, all of that information is right there for you. Location, hours of operation, what you can and can't bring, if there are any fees, all of that is right there, right on our website. Um, someone made a comment, thank you. Um, someone made a comment that um, about, you know, some things that their individual garbage hauler, their, their rules. And um, so for example, she's saying that they said they do take shredded paper that she asked them specifically, but they said no aluminum foil. So she's, you know, and it is sort of the larger question. So she's wondering, you know, do they have different buyers, but if it's all going to the same processing facility, wouldn't hey, it but, right so the, first of all the collectors are just collectors they're being they're being um paid to collect and drop it off at the transfer station the transfer station's job is to aggregate the material and get it to the material recovery facility the material recovery facility's job is to sort everything and sell it as a commodity so it's not the collector's decision what is acceptable and is not it's our decision could be someone who has All American Waste who has their own material recovery facility. All American Waste services sort of more of the northern, they service a little bit of Brookfield and northern part of our region. Um, but uh, aluminum is a very high value commodity. 
So why anyone would say don't put aluminum in the mix recycling would be baffling enough for me to say, whoever you are, please call me <laughs> or email me <laughs> at info at hre.org. So I'd like to clarify that. Um, there's no reason why they should say that shredded paper is acceptable. I also want to say that we have 60 registered haulers in our region. They are registered to do business to collect at the curb. It doesn't mean they're educated. It doesn't mean that they know what is and isn't acceptable. They should be. They sign a form uh, when they register to, to be educated. Um, we have some amazing collectors, haulers who, are, who really inform themselves and go way out of their way to educate their customers. And we have other collectors, haulers who really don't care. They just wanna give you a container, pick it up every week and get paid. So um, if you wanna know what's in and what's out, it's through the HRA, not through our haulers. Okay. Um, so, and someone is saying, you know, um, that they've heard that food scraps, at least I guess from without, that don't have the recycling program are incinerated and not composted. Or maybe she's um, saying when, they're, when, they're, when they are collected because otherwise it would just be in the garbage, right? So, right. So if they're sent in your household garbage, it's being incinerated and that doesn't even make any sense, right? Food scraps are mostly water and we're sending it to a waste to energy plant um, to be, you know, to an incinerator to be made into energy and it's mostly water, it doesn't make sense. Um, it's 32% of our waste stream. It's a natural, it's a resource. Uh, it, we can make compost and have an amendment for our soil and, and put it back into our earth. So um, yes, in theory right now it's being incinerated. That's because it's in your household trash but we wanna capture that. And if you don't know um, how to compost or you have a fear of composting, but you have an interest, um, I'm teaching a similar class like this tonight um, on March 5th, it's on our HRA website, uh, Home Composting Class 101. So Great. if you wanna learn how to compost, uh, check out our website. Thank you. Um, I just as an aside, I remember reading about a program, I think it was in a, in a municipality in Spain, where to combat uh, kitchen waste, they encouraged or even maybe provided chickens to people. So they'd keep chickens, the chickens would eat the scrap, it yes. would go in the waste stream, people would have eggs. And that was, <laughs> so I thought that I was love kind, it. Of cool, I love kind of it. a cool program. Um, so, um, so uh, you know, some more um, questions about um, educa uh, education, you know, whether there's um, any sort of education um, happening in the schools. Um, yes. So, if you want to talk so about we, um, HRRA, uh, we go into the school system. We, we will teach K through 12, but we focus on third grade because that, that's the state curriculum on waste reduction and recycling. Uh, Believe it or not, it is not easy to get into the schools. And even before COVID, uh, very difficult. A lot of schools are just not that open to these free public education programs, which is shocking. But we do have um, some consistent schools and consistent teachers who come back to us each year wanting us to come into the classroom. Um, we have a comprehensive program at a ch ch child's level um, that talks about where does our waste go and um, what can we recycle and we bring bags of recyclables and it's very interactive um, so that we can teach our children about waste reduction and recycling right. Um, so let's see here. Um, yeah, I, I, we'll do two more questions. One, which I actually really want to know too, which is the fall le like leaves in the in the fall. So they're just going the. I mean, oh, if for what the do we do with them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, um, we don't put leaves in our solid waste. Um, actually, um, yard debris is banned from solid waste stream, except in except invasives. We have a there is a an exemption for invasives through our municipalities. But there are towns that do accept leaves at the local transfer station. Again, if you go to the HRRA website and you click on your drop-off center and you can, if you click on your drop-off center and you get all of, there's like a drop-down menu for each town. And I'm just looking it up for an example. Um, if you, my website is very, very slow. Um, there should be a section for like brush leaves and each individual town will say whether or not um, they take leaves at your local drop-off. Um, 
Um, what do you recommend for it? I mean, there's incinerating, there's, I mean, there's only so many options, right? So, right. So we don't want you to incinerate. Um, we don't want you to incinerate any yard waste. So don't put it in your household trash. If your local drop-off does not accept it, there are locations throughout the region like um, Ferris Mulch, in Danbury, there's New Milford Farms in New Milford. It's not a farm, by the way, it's just called New Milford Farms. It's actually a company that makes mulch and compost. Um, they're a national company, actually. Um, they will take yard debris, including leaves, and they compost it. Um, so check out the HRA website, look under your individual town, under yard waste, and it will say whether it takes um, brush or leaves, et cetera. Brookfield does not take leaves, I do not believe, at the yard, um, at the refuse location in the center of town. I will double check that as we're talking. Do the, um, do the uh, towns that have composting, the facilities that offer some sort of compost, you know, food scrap composting, do, do they ever take yard waste? Like, do they ever take- And it's individual transfer stations okay. take different type of yard debris. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna clarify that the town of Brookfield accepts leaves at the Yard Refuse Disposal Center. Um, it's located um, next to the town hall on Pocono Road. Okay, thank you. Um, and there was one thing I thought we could end on um, and that someone asked, um, are there any laws pending that we should be supporting or opposing regarding yes. recycling? And what yeah. new laws would you like to see regarding recycling? Thank you. What a great ending question. So I'm proud to say that I proposed some legislation this year and I wrote a bill um, for extended producer responsibility for propane tanks. Uh, very difficult to manage. They're very dangerous. Um, it was uh, passed through the Environment Committee. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it will be called to the House floor and will pass this year. Um, it is combined with an EPR building bill for tires and smoke detectors. So just like paint and mattresses and e-waste, our municipalities, all of us will have easy, accessible, and free disposal for those three items please um, write to your state representatives and senators and tell them that you support it. Steve Harding, write to Steve Harding, email him, call him and tell him you support um, the EPR bill for tires, propane and smoke detectors. Um, there's also the bill to expand and modernize the bottle bill. Um, that is a really important bill, support that. So um, continue to keep an eye out on legislation, um, even through the HRA. Uh, there is a minimum recycled content bill this year that would require manufacturers to use at least a certain percentage of minimum recycled content, 20 to 30%. That creates a circular economy. That creates the reason why we're recycling, a good system for why we're recycling. If manufacturers aren't using it, why are we recycling it? We need the manufacturers in this system. So we need the legislation to make them required to use it and not use virgin material just because it's cheaper. Um, so thank you for that question. Happy Earth Day. Um, I appreciate you all being with me this evening. I know we lost a few, but for those of you who stood, um, stuck it out, I, I appreciate it. And I hope you learned something new tonight. Um, and I hope you spread the word of recycling right. Jennifer, thank you so much. That was really, really wonderful. And, um, and since we recorded this program, um, it'll be on the Brookfield Library YouTube station. So you can tell your friends and family to, if they, if they don't know some of these things, they can, they can watch the, the presentation as well. So, thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. Bye-bye. Have a great